Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, kind of brief lecture on um, uh, front end, which um, I know we have like seven, six or seven people here, which is about as many as I expected. Um, it's a pretty like boutique topic, um, and it's really just to give you a sense of what it's like building front ends for the web. The first thing I'm going to ask is, is there anyone in this live lecture who's currently doing the 1531 project? Um, who would like to volunteer for me to use their back end when we do some of this stuff today. If you could just post your group name in the chat, that would be good. So <coughs> it's mainly going to be a practical demo today, um, though in general it's, it's definitely worth us going through some um, more theoretical topics, which includes, um, you know, like what the hell is building front ends. Now, if you're a 1531 student, you probably understand this because you know, you're know you building a Python server on the back end and then that's being used by a front end. And we're gonna talk about what the differences between those two things are. Um, if you're more interested in these topics, generally speaking, um, two good places to look are, uh, if you're interested in like user experience, design and stuff, then COMP3511 or 4511 is a good course. If you're interested in the technical aspects, then COMP6080 is a good course. Um, and in general, what these courses help you do, <coughs> in particular 3511 and 4511, is they try and help you not build bad interfaces. There's a fun website you can go to, it's userinterface.com, except instead of a T, it's a, it's a Y, um, which is trying to demonstrate, you know, how do we build terrible user-facing experiences, you know. Um, and this is a funny little website where you're not sure what to click. And then when you click stuff, and it's all very confusing. Um, so, it's fun. Um, anyway, so let's get on with it. So, the first thing is, when we're building web applications, um, typically we have two aspects, right? You have a, a client, which is what we call a front end, <coughs> and that typically runs on a web browser. That's like Chrome, or Firefox, Safari, and these web browsers interpret front end code on them, right? So, like if you want to think about it a certain way, your web browser, like Google Chrome that I'm using here, is actually a compiler. It, it compiles code, right? It's not Python, it's not C, it's a different type of set of languages. Um, and they all run on the front end on your computer. That code can run without an internet. It runs on your machine. Then you have backends, which you typically run <coughs> in a centralized place, like your project. And those two things talk to each other. Um, and hopefully like that concept of them talking makes sense. And today's really about, well, how do we actually build something on the, on the client side? So first thing is there are three languages that web browsers work with. And we can, um, we can code with them, right? So if I open up Firefox here, um, I can also create a file. I might open up a Let's, let's create a file, we'll call it um, uh, 1531.html. Hi. And what I'm going to do... Oh, Discord or <laughs> No. Okay, give me a sec. Let's try now. Hello. Okay. Discord is still exceeded? Or what? No, no, no. Disk space. Ah. Oh. Lord. Give me a sec. If you ever have this, you just kind of get rid of random stuff. Um, week two backend. I don't remember what that is, so let's keep it for now. Sure. Not enough disk space. Oh, this is really killing me. I have enough disk space, though. Oh, oh well. Okay, let's try this out. So I'm going to open up my text editor, right, and I'll open up a file called 1531.html, and hopefully it lets me save it, uh, no thanks, I'm just going to close all of these, yep, hi, oh, okay, it worked apparently, um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this file inside the web browser, and I can actually do that, you can do that directly just by opening it, um, you can also like find it in, um, like if you open up your home folder, you can literally just find 15300HTML, drag it into your browser like this. Bam, done. 
Um, <coughs> and this is this is a web page now, right? And the browser is compiling this. Now there are three major things that a web browser compiles. And the first one is HTML, the second one is CSS, the third one is JavaScript. Now HTML are the building blocks of the internet. They're the things that have existed a long time and you've probably seen them. For instance, if I want to make this text bold, I can wrap it in this tag, is what we call it. So HTML is a very simple language that's basically just made up of tags. Um, yep, okay, there we go. It's loading now. It's being really weird. Um, you know, hi Hayden. Now, you understand that when it comes to a normal programming language, you write code called source code, like your Python, and then that is compiled, oh, like C is a good example, and then that's compiled to something else. Now, when it comes to websites, a similar thing happens. So this is the actual source code that your browser gets. It's the code you wrote. Um, is there a buzzing noise? Oh, sorry. Let me just listen to my own voice one sec. I can hear it. Okay, one sec. Bam, gone. Okay, wonderful. Um, all right. I wish I understood electronics. Uh, electronics are crazy. There's all these like static signals running and I don't know. Um, but you can blame this thing. That was the problem. <coughs> this is my source code in the browser here. And that compiles, if you will, to this. This is what actually um, builds. Right? This is what actually gets produced on the page. Um, so that's a web browser's job. A web browser's job is to take HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and convert it into stuff to be displayed on a web page. Great. Okay. So what is HTML? Well, <coughs> again, HTML is the easiest thing. It's a series of tags. Um, you can do things like create paragraphs, right? Like if I want to have a one paragraph, I can create a whole bunch of paragraphs like this. I can put a header above it, my paragraphs like this. Um, I can put a new line between some paragraphs like that. I can, um, I mean, this just honestly goes on and on. There's like tons of different tags, right? Very basic web page. Here's my header. Here are my paragraphs. Here's a new line. <coughs> Here are more paragraphs. Um, and some of these other things escape me. But, um, and if you have a look here, this is the source code, right? So your browser literally interprets the source code and produces something with it. Now, if you want to learn more about HTML, you can go and Google HTML. Right, like you can be like, you know, HTML tags and you can look up different types of things you can do with them. Um, <coughs> but overall, HTML is very, very simple. It's about providing the structure of a web page. It's about providing the kind of basic layout, if you will. Um, you know, if, if you kind of think about like, uh, like what's, a, what's an example, like a wood framed house. You know, this is a way to think about HTML. There's a hundred ways you could think about it, but it's like HTML's job is to provide the structure of what you're doing. It's not there to make it look good. It's not there to make it do anything. It doesn't really make anything workable in its own, but it helps lay the foundations upon which you attach everything else to. Um, so HTML structure. CSS is about style or maybe what you called visuals or aesthetics and JavaScript is about functionality and JavaScript's a very deep dark hole that you could spend a lot of time on but CSS is it stands for cascading style sheets and it's another language that a browser can interpret that allows you to make <coughs> things look pretty and the way CSS works is that CSS is a whole bunch of properties that you can assign to particular HTML elements. So I'm going to keep things very, very simple today. So for example, if I would like to change the font size of my header, h2 means header level 2, um, then on every single HTML tag, you can add a series of attributes to it. Right? Now, what are attributes? Well, every HTML tag is made up of something like this. Right? So what this says is that this is the opening of my h2 element, header 2, and this is the closing of my h2 element. Everything in between there is what is my h2 element. <coughs> so I've specified that's the type of tag it is, but then after that tag, before I finish the opening tag, um, I specify a series of attribute value pairs. 
So as in this particular attribute has this particular value and then this particular attribute has this particular value. Now different tags have different attributes, but all tags have a standard attribute, which is style. Now, what you put here inside the style tag is CSS. And CSS, again, is a very simple language. It's made up of key value pairs. Now, what we mean by that is that you specify that this property has this value. This property has this value. And the way it works, typically, is that if you want to say something, like my font size <coughs> is 20 points, you do that. And if you want to say something like the color is going to be blue, you do this. And this is how CSS works. It's a series of key value pairs that are connected with colons and semicolons. So I <coughs> represent a single property by doing key colon attribute or key colon value. And then I join a series of those key value pairs by using a semicolon. And if I would like to apply those to a particular HTML element, I can put them inside the style tag like this. So that now we're saying my header two, which is HTML, has these particular <coughs> CSS properties, which is, you know, font size is this, color is that, um, yes. Is this something like <coughs> latex? I don't know. <coughs> I don't know how to answer that question. It's like if you ask me is a banana something like an apple, it's like depends what your frame of reference is, you know. Like if you're asking are they both ways that you can use a particular language to help try and enact a particular visual output, then like yes. If you're asking in the sense of like, because I know latex, would I learn this pretty easily? It's like probably not. So, um, see so now I refresh that and our head is big and it's blue and I can make it bigger, um, like this and I can make it a different color like red. So that's CSS's job. It's to style web pages. It's to make them <coughs> look good. It is the, you know, the clothes, the, the paint on our structure. <coughs> yeah, both latex and um, HTML and markup languages. I don't really know what the definition of a markup language is. Um, I'm not sure if it's like... I mean, I think someone said to me once that, you know, these languages are non-Turing complete languages or something. So, like, basically something's a markup language if, like, you can't really do if statements and loops and other things. You're just simply like describing it. Um, markdown that you use, or like we use um, <coughs> on GitLab and stuff, that's, an <coughs> that's another markup language. Okay, so we've done some basic CSS. You could do more CSS if you want. I could make these paragraphs a little bit smaller, like this. Yeah, I could, I could apply this one to each of those. Now again, CSS just like HTML, is something that you could take as far as you want in terms of I've just shown you two properties here which is font size and color um, and you could add more and more and more and more if you'd like right nothing nothing stopping you um, googling researching you know you've got like you can make text bold you can underline it you can change how much space is around it and everything else like that <coughs> now JavaScript which is the fun one or the less fun one, depending on how you think about it. Um, JavaScript, in some ways, is easier because it's it's an actual programming language, which means it's similar to what you will have worked with. And in some ways, I have Tab Reloader on, do I? Oh, no, I don't. Okay. And in some ways, it's harder because unlike HTML and CSS, it's not a markup language, so you can't just be like, yeah, CSS is just a whole bunch of key value pairs done, everything. Now. The way JavaScript works on HTML pages is if you ever want to write JavaScript, you open up a script tag like this. Everything inside a script tag is typically JavaScript and it's good practice to describe what type of scripting it is because I think browsers are capable of dealing with other languages. Um, but now everything inside of here is JavaScript. If I try and write HTML, <coughs> the browser won't be interpreting it anymore like it's HTML. 
everything inside this script tag is JavaScript. So when I do this, for instance, um, all that happens is that it complains. Now, what I just did here was I pressed F12 and I brought up the developer tools, which is the panel on the right hand side that like programmers use to debug their websites. And I clicked on the console tab, which is actually like the equivalent of your terminal, right? So you know when you run Python files on your computer and um, you have a terminal where it displays outputs and errors and stuff like that. The browser actually has the same thing under the console tab. It's actually even really useful for your project because um, if you have issues with your front end, you can actually look there and sometimes you'll get errors that might hint what's going, going on. Um, so I refresh this and you see here I get an error. Expected expression got open square bracket. So that's complaining because it's like this isn't valid code. Now, JavaScript is in many ways quite similar to Python um, if, you com if your baseline is other programming languages. So if you know Python, JavaScript's pretty similar compared to C and C++ and Java and everything else like that. They are very different languages, but um, I think the knowledge is relatively translatable. I'll give you the basics though of JavaScript, um, <coughs> which are just the actual programming language itself. You can define variables in JavaScript like this. Um, in JavaScript, const variables can't be modified after they're created. Let variables can be modified after they're created. JavaScript is a loosely typed language just like Python. So therefore, you don't define the type unlike C and Java. Um, it defines it for you and you just give it the, the thing. Um, and instead of when I want to print something to the terminal in Python, I write a plus B, right? Whereas in JavaScript, I do console log A plus B. Now, it's important to understand this is not getting printed to the web page, right? You got to think about this, like, you got to think about JavaScript, like, and this other stuff, like, it's just another programming language being compiled by the web browser. And when you print something in Python, it doesn't appear on your screen, it appears in the terminal. And in JavaScript, it's the same. When I compile this and I run this, it, it prints out on the terminal. So if I refresh this page, you see now my terminal actually printed out three because I got variable A, variable B, it added them together and it printed out that. <coughs> I can also print out some strings, hello there, like this. And that will also print out on the terminal, right? Pretty straightforward. Any questions so far? Why do we use JavaScript and not Python in the front end? I mean, the shortest answer is that um, web browsers don't have a Python compiler. I'm sure if someone really wanted to, they could they could build a web browser or an engine that a web browser could use that would be able to interpret Python and do stuff with Python. Um, but it just doesn't exist. Um, and even if it did, it would take probably years of work, years of serious professional work. Um, the thing to understand is that historically, like Python has been a scripting language used for what you all use it for. JavaScript has been the language of web browser front ends. And over the years, JavaScript has blown up and kind of gone out and gotten a lot closer to Python. So there's no problems that you would so use Python to solve. Like there's no problems that JavaScript solved 10 years ago that Python solves now. But there's a lot of um, Python problems now that you might solve JavaScript, use JavaScript to solve because JavaScript's just a little bit more diverse than it used to be. Okay, so we know how to program. I don't need to show you for loops or anything like I could, you know, like for let i equal zero, i less than 10, plus plus i, um, console log, hello, plus i, or like comma i, right? Like it's a programming language. It does what you expect. Hello, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, where should we look up for learning JavaScript other than just Googling it? Um, like, I don't, I don't know. The resources change so quickly and the language itself changes very quickly. Um, 
generally i think w3 schools are still a good basic one to follow like the w3 school site it's very basic um but that's kind of good because <coughs> it, it you know it'll just take you through the real bare bones of it um yeah it's hard to go wrong though <coughs> um, and experimenting is the best way to deal with it so alright the main thing we want to talk about today though is actually running the back end so um, Cosmo said HO9 uh, blinker Thursday 09 B blinker <coughs> okay so Thursday 09 B blinker I'm going to clone their repo and we'll run it and then we'll try and talk to it okay so I'm gonna go inside blinker great um, let's just try to run it and see if it Oops. Okay, seems to work. Okay, so that backend's running on port 9877. Um, <coughs> now, sorry for the cough. Um, now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to try and talk to that um, backend. Now, in JavaScript... Um what we do if we want to call like if we want to talk to a backend is that you can um uh, i'm trying to think let me just wrap something maybe sorry i'm just trying to think about what's a good way to do this that isn't strange Okay, so if we look at some simple code here, what I want you to look at this and understand is that um, think of it, think of this a little bit like a main function. There's so much depth to this, I couldn't even begin to talk about it. But it's like this, I might even call this main. Imagine this is our main function. Now you don't always need a main function. I mean, you never need a main function, but in this sense, it's how we're going to get around some more complicated parts of JavaScript. Um, and inside of that, we execute some code that says, "Hey, now if I'd like to make a request to a web page." I can do that um, pretty easily using the fetch command. So fetch is a function that is built into your web browser um, that basically um, like <coughs> fetches web pages. And like for an example, there's a web page up here from another course in another term called score.json, which is literally just a JSON string on the internet. And if I want to say grab that, I could take that URL there and I could just put it inside this fetch here. And then if I want to get the result of the fetch, I could say result um, equals something like this and I'll console log the result. And there's a couple of new concepts here. Okay, there you go. So the first new concept is we've got this random await variable. Basically in JavaScript, if you ever do something that is um, threaded, like opening a file, closing a file, making a network request, it's probably one of the one of one of the big differences with Python. So, um, with Python, everything by default is kind of synchronous. And if you want something to run in another thread, you kind of have to do threading stuff like we did last week. Um, JavaScript's kind of the other way around. It's like by default, it will automatically do blocking operations in other threads. As in, when I call fetch, it will actually run that and keep moving just like your send later or your um, stand up start and stuff. And I have to explicitly tell us, no, um, I want you to actually behave like a normal programming language here and just execute this one by one. Don't do any weird stuff. Um, so that's what that await is. <coughs> it's just there to make this kind of behave like Python, if you will. Um, so yeah, I run this and look, I get a response. I, I console logged it. This is what the browser is getting back. It's got all this stuff here. Um, the body is somewhere inside of here and I could extract that. So we actually made a network request. 
And you can see that network request being made if I go to the network tab. Watch this, when I refresh this page, it actually loads this up. You can see here it's loading up score.json. The status was 200 because the request was successful. It was a get request to this URL and the response was this JSON body, right? Um, that was the raw payload, this is it converted to JSON. So <coughs> on VLAB here, I made a network request to CSE's machine um, to actually get some data. Now what we would like to do is, um, uh, we would like to actually talk to the backend that we ran, which is this one here. So let's try and do this. Now this backend is this, and let's try and talk to the register, auth register v2, is it v2 or v1? I think it's v2, isn't it? See if you, I can answer myself before you answer me. Or register v2 yep okay <coughs> good so um let's try and call that All right let's fetch that let's see what happens i might move this terminal down here let's make this one a little bit smaller great okay and let's refresh 405 All right so i made a network request here and you can see it responded with 405 which is this method is not allowed for the requested url now that's because fetch by default just like a web browser makes all their requests as get requests so if i google now javascript fetch post request i will probably find something that helps me understand how to make post requests with the fetch i'm just going to search for post till i find something that doesn't scare me and I can see here that when someone is calling fetch, they're giving it the URL they want to fetch, and then after that they're giving it a dictionary which consists of a key that is method post. Okay, and I can also see they've got this other thing here which is like headers and body. I might actually copy that because that looks really useful, right? Because when we call um, uh, when we call register, we want to give it some data. <coughs> so now what's happening is we're calling auth register v2. It's a post method. We're giving it some headers, which are probably necessary. And then we're giving it a body, right? So this is a lot like ARC and Postman and stuff. Rem like, and remember, that's all they are. Like Those tools like ARC are just trying to mock front ends. You're just a client calling a server. And we're a client calling a server. It just so happens that our client today is a web browser. So, cool. I'm going to save that, I'm going to run it again, and now I get a couple of messages. What do I get here? I get I get a 200 and then I get a, oh no, is that what this is? Yeah. Um, so this is a little bit complicated, what's going wrong here. Let me just see if I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what the problem is. Um, Okay, yeah, so, or maybe that was fine. Oh, it looks like it was fine. Okay, you can probably disregard what I did. I think. Sorry, I just need to... Okay, I think we can disregard it. Sorry, that was annoying of me. Um, let me just open this file again. Okay, so <coughs> you notice what's happening here is that when I try and register, I'm sending this request from my front end to Flask, and Flask is responding with an error which says um, 400. What does 400 mean? 400 means input error, and that's probably because I'm not actually passing in anything. Well, what does the front end want taken in when I call it? Well, we can check that out because we have a spec. It wants uh, email, password, name, first name, last. So let's try that. 
So this body here, currently I'm giving it an empty dictionary. But let's actually give it a dictionary full of some items. So I'm going to say register body. Like this. And I'll give it an email of hayden.smith at unsw. I'll give it a password of I love comp1031. Name first is Hayden. Name last is Smith. Great. <coughs> so, and then this is what's going to get JSONified. So you know that in, in JSON you do something like, in um, Python you do something like um, JSON dot dumps, like that. Um, <coughs> JavaScript uses JSON dot stringify. This is built in, we don't need to import anything. Okay, so now let's try it. Let's refresh the page now. Oops, still a 400. What have I done wrong here? I've probably forgotten some character or something. It probably returns me some data, hopefully. Let's decode the body in a sec. And we can have a look at it. So, when I get this result, I can actually get the JSON that your front end... Um, what's wrong with line 21? I don't think there's a problem there. Um, I can actually get the JSON that your backend returns me by saying um, body equals await result.json. So what happens is fetch returns an HTTP response. That's like, that's like an entire chunk of stuff. And then inside of that is the body. And you can actually see this here, right? The response that gives me the, oops. It gives me the URL, it gives me the status, it gives me all of this stuff. But I just want this body. And to get the body out of a response with fetch, um, if it's a JSON body, I can just do this one. I just want to get result.json. Okay, so we can have a look at this. So now I'm gonna have a look at the body that I get given back. So I refresh the page. And here we go. Sorry, your email is not valid. Right? Okay, I don't know why it's not valid. I can't remember the rules. Aiden.smith at Gmail. Now it worked, right? So when I loaded this page, it ran the fetch, it ran the JavaScript, and what happened was um, it actually returned me something. I got the user ID and I got the token. If I try and load the page again, I get sorry your email's already taken, right? Because it's persistent. So now what we'll do is I'm going to show you how to trigger things based on a button. So we know that backend works, we don't need to look at that too much. I'm going to put a button on the page that I'm going to call, <coughs> um, I'm going to give it an ID, that's like a unique identifier. I'm going to call that login button or register button. And it'll say register like this. If I refresh the page, there's a register button. Now what's happening <coughs> by default here is that because this JavaScript is like at the root level, every time I run it, every time I load the page, it's running the JavaScript, right? It's a little bit just like writing Python code, not inside an if name equals main. It just always runs by virtue of the fact that the file is being processed. If I want instead for this to happen inside of um, something, I've got my main function here that tries to register rather than just calling main. Like if I comment this out, nothing happens, right? Because I've defined a function, but the function's never used. In JavaScript, I can, this is where things get a little bit weird, I can bind a particular event to a particular element on the screen by writing this fairly verbose line. Um, sure. So, Great. So what's happening here is document is the web page, the whole thing. Get element by ID is how I get a particular element on that web page. Think about it like collecting a particular HTML tag. Add event listener is how for that tag, I can then say on click, which is a mouse click, I want you to execute this function. So it's saying execute this function when it's clicked on this element which exists in the document. So that's why when I load the page now, nothing happens. But when I click register, I get this. Sorry, your email is already being used. I could create a second button for login. And what I'm going to do with login 
is totally copy this function. And I'm going to rename this function to register now instead of main. So I'm going to have another function <coughs> called login. <coughs> Sorry. Which is just going to pass in the username and password. Identical function though. And then I'm going to create another line here um, where on the when I click the login button now, which is another HTML attribute, another button I made here, on click I want to call login. So when I click the register button, a register function is called, which does some stuff. When I click login, a login button is called, which does some stuff. So register is always like, sorry, the email's already used, but when I click login, I get a new I get a new token every time. Like this. Then I could take that token and go make some other HTTP requests to other routes and stuff. Um, and if I wanted to clean up my code here, um, I probably couldn't clean this up too much, but um, yeah, anyway. So I guess the last thing um, I'll show you is um, so. I showed you here how we, we take an HTML element and we bind a click event to it. Um, <coughs> but what we also might want to do is actually take something from an HTML element. So if I make a, I'm going to do a new line. If I make a, two inputs, right? And this first input is um, a text input, just a little box where people can enter stuff. And the second input is a password input like this. Um, what happens if I type in hayden.smith at gmail.com and I type in I love comp 1531? What happens if I want to pull that out of the input, right? I don't want to hard code it like I've done here. I want to pull that out. So instead of um, instead of hard coding this in here, I can actually do document dot get element by ID dot something, which in this case will be value. Now, every form input has a value property that is the actual text inside of it. What ID does it have? I haven't given it one yet, so I'll have to give it one here, which is like email or like login input email or something like this. And then I'll do the same one for the password, login email, login input password. So now I want to go get that particular HTML element and I want to get the value inside of it. And then I want to do the same thing for password here. So now instead of hard coding it, I'm pulling it from the actual web page. And let's see if this one works. All right, it seems to work. If I get the wrong password, I get an error. Sorry, your password's incorrect. Sorry, your password's incorrect. Like this. So now we're actually like taking from the web page and using that for our dynamic code. So I don't want to, I have a pretty effed throat. So I don't want to like talk all the way to 12. So I'm going to wrap up at 11.55 and take a break for my talking. Um, but in our <coughs> kind of eight minutes left, um, are there any lingering questions here? I mean, hopefully this has given you a very, very simple overview of like um, the kinds of things that are involved with doing some basic talking to servers and stuff. Any lingering questions? Very quiet, okay. Um, would you like me to share this code? Would people like me to put this code in the repo somewhere? Okay, yeah, I'll put it up in, um, I'll probably put it up in week, probably put it up in week eight because that's where the lecture is meant to be and I don't want to change all the numbers. We'll just pretend this happened last week. Um, Cool. Okay. Well, let's let's finish up early then. Um, I'll put this up there later today, um, in week eight, um, 
And yeah, other than that, um, take a break and I'll talk to you in 15 minutes for the lecture. So thanks everyone. Hope that was fun.